Hi again, I'm Ron Klaus here again for session four in our series, Things That Shape Us Without Our Permission. Here's a starter question to get us thinking about where we're going. How much can one person do to change the world? I hope that after the last talk, you had a good discussion about some of the important things that led to the first experiment in Judeo-Christian worldview and culture. In this and the next talk, we're gonna see how this worldview, having seemingly failed, picked itself up and came to life again, upgraded itself, and this time eventually dominated the West for many centuries, then influenced many other parts of the world and left its mark on all of us. We ended the previous talk with a seemingly defeated Hebrew people, the last of whom were deported to Babylon in 587 BCE. We're now gonna take a long leap forward to the beginning of our era. I'm gonna be saying a lot about Jesus and in our next time about his followers, because it was he and they that were behind the formulation of the more modern Judeo-Christian religion, worldview, and culture. Jesus was raised in a small town called Nazareth. Since he lived and died in what were the occupying Romans uh, uh, thought that it was a backwater province, there's not a lot about him recorded outside the Bible. But there's enough, there are enough such references to confirm that he existed, was an itinerant preacher, was thought to be a miracle worker, was eventually crucified, but left behind him a group of growing followers. That much we know about from non-biblical sources. But before we talk further about him and his followers, we have to face two critical questions. The first one is, is the universe open or closed? What we mean by open is, is there some plane of reality, something that really exists beyond the physical universe that could actually influence us? The other option is to say that physical reality is all there is. When we talk about spiritual experiences or connections, we're still talking about things inside people's heads, not things that really are out there. This option is what we mean by closed. Everyone in the Near East and beyond it, up through Jesus' time and long after him, believed that the universe was open. The Hebrews didn't believe the pagan stories of their gods, but they certainly believed that the universe was open. In fact, they believed that there was a powerful chief god out there with whom they were in covenant. But the second question pushes us even further. Jesus' followers not only believed that the universe was open, but that one of the divine beings in that world beyond us actually visited this planet. That person was Jesus, whom they believed, entered history as a baby born of a virgin, grew up as an itinerant prophet, was crucified for his defiance of the Jewish hierarchy, but rose from his grave, stayed with his followers for 40 days, and then ascended back to his beyond the universe original habitation. Many of his first generation followers not only believed this, but claimed to have been eyewitnesses of these things. Furthermore, they not only took them to be historical events, but when internalized, found them to have life transforming power. Now again, you may or may not believe this, but if we're to understand the influence of Jesus and his followers on his and our culture, we have to understand that his followers did believe these things. And they are what, that's what motivated them to do the things they did and produced an unexpected but profound outcome. So here we go about Jesus. He was a complex character, hard to completely wrap your mind around. But let me try in the next few minutes to try to summarize what he said and is alleged to have done, at least from my understanding of the best writings about him. So you will see how he sowed many of the ideas that shaped Judeo-Christian culture and have affected us all. The central motif in Jesus' teaching was that in his person, the kingdom of God had come. What he meant by this is that the Abrahamic and Moses covenant their relationship with the chief God was going to be restored. Furthermore, he was the divine king that was heading it all up. He validated his claim by his personal acts of power. The stories about him record healings of the sick, dismissing demons, opposing oppressive religion, asserting and backing up his authority to forgive sins, and they record instances of his power over nature. Thus, his followers took loyalty to him to be their highest loyalty, higher than their loyalty to their immediate political establishment. He emphasized the need for heart change, not merely behavioral conformity. This was not new in Judaism, but Jesus took it to a new level. Murder was not the problem. The hatred of people's hearts was where it came from. Adultery was not the problem. The lust that led to it was. He said that following him, if done conscientiously, would lead to an inner transformation so extensive that it was akin to being born again. Next, his kingdom of God does not bring more people into it through force or violence. It requires a voluntary and personal surrender to his lordship. 
Admittedly, not everyone who claims to be his followers adheres to this principle, but it was something that Jesus taught. Because submission to his lordship was voluntary, he also made clear that not everyone in a given political unit would become his followers. Followers and non-followers would live together peacefully. They would only be separated out at the last day, which was also the day of God's judgment. This was the new and foundational step toward religious freedom that we now all enjoy. In most non-Western cultures today, you have to accept the religion into which you were born. In Jesus' vision, you were free to choose to follow him or not, although your choice had definite consequences. Next, he elevated the role of women in society. Not a few of his entourage were women as, they, as he traveled. He taught them as well as teaching men, again, something novel in his time. They were the first to meet him after his resurrection, and his followers attributed reliability to their testimonies, also something new. They occupied places of leadership in the community he formed to a degree unprecedented in both Jewish and Roman cultures. It is not an overstatement to say that every woman that occupies a place of dignity and leadership today owes the beginning of that opportunity to Jesus. Next, the kingdom of God could no longer be limited to one ethnic group. The time for the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham had come. It was, it was time for God's covenant blessing to come to all nations. Although much of Jesus' ministry was to his Jewish compatriots, he made significant forays into Gentile cities and taught and healed there just as truly as he did these things among his countrymen. But the point of this is that if people from different cultures can be in the kingdom together, then this is the foundation for peace between these cultures. Despite all their cultural and political differences, underneath them, their brothers and sisters. This is a profound foundation for peacemaking. The gatherings he advocated for his followers consisted of small meetings in which everyone could participate. This was intended to reinforce the principle that all, men, all people, men and women, slaves and free, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their social status, were of equal value before God. This was the beginning of our cherished value, that although we differ in our personalities and gifts, we all ought to have equal rights. But Jesus was not just about talk. In addition to his teaching, he tirelessly worked to make life better for the people he met. He was with them at their celebrations, not only taught them, including life skills, but he healed them, dismissed their demons, and even fed them at times. In that, he set a profound example of what it means to be in his kingdom. It's far more than mere religious experience. It's the example of abounding compassion to be poured out on a needy world. It is from Jesus' personal example that the many compassionate changes in Western society have come. Jesus was also very concerned about the current Jewish political situation. In his day, there was a great expectation of the return of God's kingdom. His fellow Jews, however, mostly believed that this would require the expulsion of the Romans from their holy land. They were ready to use force to bring it out. However, Jesus saw that the odds were heavily against them, and this was not the way God's kingdom would advance from then on. So he taught nonviolence. But he didn't see this as acquiescence. He saw this as a powerful weapon that would disarm enemies as well as gain God's favor. He predicted that the Jews would not listen to his warnings, but would continue in a violent confrontation with the Romans, which would lead to the total destruction of Jerusalem and result in an untold number of deaths. True enough, the Jewish thirst for armed revolution led to three major holocausts costs, and one minor one, with enormous loss of life and many cities destroyed. He publicly wept over the downfall of Jerusalem to come, because the whole city became filled with a kind of madness that could not see the inevitable coming. We also need to talk about events just before and after his death. He predicted that he would be turned over to his enemies who would kill him. He also predicted that in three days he would rise from the dead. His disciples could never get this prediction through their heads. It was an unimaginable thing to them, as it would be for us, did we not have their testimonies. On the night before his death, he had a last meal with his closest 12 followers. At that meal, he declared their previous covenant with God to be, God to be over and that the new one would begin. The former covenant was begun with animal sacrifices, which were also the way Jews could atone for their shortcomings. Hundreds of years ago, their prophets announced, however, that God had considered them unfaithful to their covenant with him and that their covenant with him had been broken. This left them deserted by God and explained their difficult lot, deportation, a disappointing return to their homeland, mostly under oppressive foreign governments. He said that his death would turn all this around. 
He would be the final sacrifice for people's shortcomings. They no longer needed to offer animals. Instead, if they trusted in his one time and final self-sacrifice, that would be sufficient to atone for all their shortcomings. Also, in talking about the former covenant, you may remember that I mentioned that, that breaking a covenant required the imposition of a curse. He said his death would also bear the curse of the previous broken covenant and so bring it to a final end. But on that evening, he declared the beginning of a new covenant with God that all his followers, that Jews and non-Jews alike, could enter. That would bring them again under the benefits of the old covenant that led to such blessing, but also would obligate them to God, much as the older one did. Now you would think that what Jesus taught and did would endear him to the people of his day. It did, at least to some of them, at least for a while. His loyalty to him would not endure for the same reason good leaders in our day are often scorned and resisted. First, he challenged the corrupt leadership of the current Jewish authorities until they could no longer tolerate it. Second, many people groaning under Roman oppression could no longer endure his proposal of peacemaking and so deserted him, even though they were resorting to a suicidal alternative. Thus, that same night he was arrested, and on the next day, on Friday, April 3rd, 33 CE, he was nailed to a cross, a wooden pole with a cross piece to hold his nail-pierced hands or wrists, while his feet were also nailed to the pole. There he died a painful and shameful death. As he died, he prayed that God would forgive his tormentors. But the following Sunday, his tomb was found empty, and various ones of his followers reported seeing and being with him on that very day. He met with them for the following 40 days, on one occasion with at least 500 of them. When he was with them, he completed his teaching and prepared them for what was to follow. Then he took a small group with him to the top of a small mountain outside of Jerusalem and disappeared into a cloud, never personally to be seen again. In the next talk, I'll go on both to see how and why Jesus' followers embraced this story and even in their lifetimes carried it far into and beyond the Roman Empire, into Europe, far east into Asia, south into Africa, and much later to the New World of the Western Hemisphere. I will also try to help us see how, beginning in the 18th century, it began to be undermined and led to the next two Western, major Western worldviews. But here's a question that may help you to begin your discussion. Even today, it often seems like good ideas that would make life better for many people, such as equal rights for all, available and affordable health care for all, the moderation of our terribly unequal incomes, stopping things we do to hurt our climate, etc., would be well received and implemented. And here's the question for you to talk about. Why are we so slow in getting together to do them? Is there anything we can do about it? Well, good to have been with you. I look forward to being with you next time.